Christ is risen. Christos anesti. Christo ha resucitado. You can do that louder. There is um there's a lot in this gospel passage. It's one of the longer ones that we read. It's thirty seven verses. Um but there's a bunch of stuff packed into that. We spoke briefly last night of the condescension of Christ to this Samaritan woman. And to cover that very quickly, the Samaritan woman came to the well in the heat of the day to draw her water. And she was alone. Now, when you're drawing water in a climate like the Middle East, Samaria, it's not something you choose to do at the hottest part of the day. You do it early in the morning. You do it late in the evening, maybe. But you don't do it during the heat of the day. But this woman was an outcast. She was not admired within the city. She was looked down upon as we will hear when Christ speaks to her, she'd already had five husbands, and the man she was with now was not her husband. She was not, apart from being a Sumerian, or Samaritan, which is not considered, you know, very good in the eyes of the Jews, she was a woman that was looked down upon because of the life that she had led. But Christ comes to her and talks to her and offers her the living water. Notice when his disciples return, they're wondering, why is he talking to this woman? It's not something that would be expected from a rabbi, from a teacher. But Christ, as throughout his ministry, comes to the lowest and offers them the highest, this living water. So what is the living water? When Christ says that whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but that the water I shall give him shall be unto him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. When he says to the woman, I would have given thee living water. And of course, she has no idea what he's talking about. She says, well, sir, you don't have anything to take the water out of the well, so how are you going to give me this living water? The living water has, of course, a connection with water in general. You know, water is absolutely essential to life. Without it, we all die. Men have lived for weeks and weeks and weeks without food. But under the best of conditions, with a week without water, one single week without water, and you're going to be drawing close to death. So how can Christ promise water after which no one will ever thirst again? The fathers of the church understand the living water to be the Holy Spirit, which was poured out on the day of Pentecost, establishing the church. If we think of this living water as a stream, because that's what living water means in a physical context. It's not water that's stagnant, like a lake or a pond, but it's water that moves, like a stream or a river. In fact, in the church, we're told that when we baptize, we prefer to baptize in living water, in a stream or a river. We condescend to the economy of a font 
or baptismal pool in a church. Uh, but that's not the preference. But if we think of living water in that sense, as a stream, as a river, where's the source? Where are the head streams of this living water? Well, it's the cross, right? We're told one of those soldiers with the spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. So the source of the living water is the cross. Its course is the church. It flows through the church in everything that we do, the, sa- the, mis- the mysteriological life, the mysteries of the church, the sacraments, which sustain and nourish us during this life. And where's the mouth? Where does this stream end? Well, it's heaven. Because Christ says, he promises a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So if we think of this living water as a stream, we start with the cross, it flows through the church and carries and empties us all into the kingdom of heaven. But there's a lot more in this passage than just the explanation of the living water. Christ makes a great revelation here. When he's speaking to the woman, having told her, after she says, I I don't have a husband, he says, you sure don't. You've already had five, and now you're with some guy that's not your husband. And Christ says that, and she looks at him, she says, sir, I think you're a prophet. And they talk, and she says unto him, I know the Messiah is coming, and he will tell us all things. And Christ says to her, I that speak unto you am he, the Messiah. This straightforward revelation of Christ's messianic role, of his divinity, if you will, is a hallmark of the Gospel of John. John's Gospel is significantly different than what we call the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which precede it. Those Gospels were written first. They're much more like an eyewitness account. In many ways, well, there might only be two people here that remember the show Dragnet, but Sergeant Joe Friday used to say what? Just the facts, ma'am. The synoptic Gospels are a little bit like an episode of Dragnet. We get just the facts. There's a little more, but it's largely a recounting of Christ's ministry, and it's chronological. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, and here's the cross, and now we rise again. This is a commonality between those first three books. But John seems to write with a different purpose. He omits many of the accounts that are in the Synoptic Gospels, but his Gospel reflects a much deeper theology. That's why we refer to him as St. John the Theologian. And it starts even with the very beginning of that Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was made, and it was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. You don't find that kind of poetic theology in any of the synoptic gospels. John writes with a purpose, and it's to proclaim in no uncertain terms the divinity of Christ. In the Synoptic Gospels, we often speak of the disciples not understanding what Christ means when he sort of gives hints or even overt statements as his divinity. And say, ah, you know, the disciples didn't understand. John, coming after the Synoptics, clears away this confusion. Christ, speaking to the Samaritan woman, doesn't even wait to be asked the question, well, 
who are you? Are you the Messiah? He just flat out tells her, I that speaketh to you am he. There's another hallmark of John's Gospels, which we see in this particular reading. And that is, apart from being theological, John's Gospels are very evangelical. And that evangelical bent runs through this particular passage, right? Christ says, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. One soweth, another reapeth. Christ is urging his disciples to evangelization. And that's, I think, extremely significant for us. Because... If there's one thing that we need to do, and I'm talking about us right here in this mission, it is to turn our focus towards evangelization. We, I think, have done some things very well. Our service to the community through the St. Juliana ministry is amazing for the size of this little mission. In April, we fed 150 people on one day. This month, it was over 100. These are amazing things, all made possible through God's grace flowing through this mission. In our services, we've served good, rich services during the festal seasons, during Pascha, during Lent. You know, we've added to the services as we go along. We're increasing, you know, our, our musical parts. We're becoming better and better at actually serving the services. We have a dedicated group of people who attend. Almost every Sunday, I know who I'm going to see here. And it's wonderful. By the way, Debbie has pneumonia, so let's keep her in our prayers. Uh, if, we're, if we're wondering why we don't have her, she, she's died. She emailed me yesterday and, and said she could make it, but she would cough through the whole thing, so she would prefer not to. So let's, let's keep Debbie in our prayers uh, as, as, you know, I hope that she's better for tomorrow. But if there's one thing that we've sort of fallen down on, it's the evangelization it's opening the doors for people to come to come through and finding people to come through and so what i'd like to do next sunday after liturgy is to spend a little time after coffee hour to talk about some different things that we can maybe start to do i'll tell you a a a little story and the boys here might remember this um in Bogota, Colombia, there's a um, Orthodox, a Greek Orthodox church in a very nice part of town. And it's served by a Colombian priest. He was born and raised in Colombia. Colombia. He went to Greece to study and to be ordained. And he, um, he also, by the way, serves the fastest liturgy you've ever seen. I mean, Colombians talk fast as it is, but this guy can finish his liturgy in about 55 minutes. And he doesn't skip a thing. Um, But in this church set, you know, in in a relatively nice area, but they'll tell you even in the nice area of Bogota, nice areas of Bogota, you're going to find people who are struggling, people who are down on their luck, people who are looking for a handout. And we went and, and attended there a few times, but one particular time that sticks with me was the first time that that we went to that particular parish. And what stuck in my mind was that as the service was coming to a conclusion, as they were preparing to distribute the antiteron to the people, the church was built in a cross shape and it had doors on the either side, the the, uh, north and the south walls and a door on the west wall. And as they were getting ready to distribute the antiteron, they opened all of the exterior doors. And people would actually come in that hadn't been in the service just to receive a little bit of bread. Now, 
obviously we lack some doors and we don't have hungry people standing outside. But the concept, I thought, that they demonstrated when they did that was remarkable. It really said something about how they viewed the church. It wasn't a closed group, even though the parishioners, and some days I don't think there were as many people as there are here, you know, some days, you know, they were always the same people. They were always the same people. But to them, they opened the entire church for everybody around. And we need to think a little bit about how we do that. John's evangelical urging to the disciples, I think, is a plain message to us. The fields are white with harvest. In fact, what I like here, Christ says to the disciples, oh, you say four months and it'll be time to harvest. I say to you, the fields are white for harvest right now. You know, in four or five months, we might be thinking we're moving into our new space and what what a great time to evangelize, right? You know, we have a, a nice shiny new place to worship. You know, let's focus in. But Christ says, no, it's not time to harvest in four months. It's time to harvest now. So I think we should take that message uh, very much to heart. By the way, who knows uh, the name of the Samaritan woman? The Samaritan woman is known in the church as St. Fotini or Svetlana. So if you've ever wondered who is a Samaritan woman, it is St. Fotini, who, by the way, became one of the great evangelists of the early church. She traveled from Samaria off all the way to North Africa and Carthage before she went to Rome and faced her martyrdom. And I had a, a, a very graphic story of the martyrdom but I've talked for for 17 minutes so I'm going to leave you simply with that idea Saint Fotini heard the call to evangelism of Christ she took up that cross and with her entire family carried it out let's plan next week at next Sunday to spend a little time after liturgy, after we have our coffee, after we say our post-communion prayers, and talk about how we're going to reap the harvest that has been sown here in this area. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen.